Okay, so I, I had, uh, so I was trying to get somewhere with this. Let me try to do that. So the, the, the point is, there's a few more things I want to say about this uh, the behavior of segment geodesics. Um, and, uh, and then I want to somehow talk about the analogous problem for the Bay-Peterson metric, which is a little bit of a problem that I can define the Bay-Peterson metric. But, so let me, let me try to do that. Forgive me if I skip something. Um, so, oh, and one more thing I wanted to say. I, I wanted to kind of, so why should one care about this kind of picture anyway? I mean, what's, where, where is this kind of, what, what motivates this picture? And I, I want to say one, at least a word about what, what the motivation is. Um, well, at least, I mean, there, were, there are different motivations. But one of my motivations uh, for thinking about this is, is its connection to the study of, of hyperbolic three manifolds. Um, and so let me, let me, so, so let me just say this very briefly so I get, you know, um, so, so suppose I, I um, think about a hyperbolic three manifold that fibers over the circle. Um, wh where does that come from? If you, if you take a surface cross zero one and identify uh, the, um, S cross zero with S cross one by some homeomorphism F, you get manifold MF, and the manifold fibers over the circle, and the fiber is the original surface F. Uh, S and F, uh, and, and, you know, and we know from Thurston that F, um, uh, F is, is Sudanasa if and only if MF admits a hyperbolic structure. Okay. And, um, and you could ask, okay, so that's, and the hyperbolic structure is unique. So from F to the hyperbolic structure, uh, this is kind of well-defined map. It's a unique map uh, by mass by rigidity, and so uh, it kind of becomes a natural question to try to understand how the, the study of how, how the structure of F, this element of the mapping class group, uh, corresponds to the geometry of of, uh, of this manifold. And so you could ask yourself as a as a kind of basic question, which turns out to be kind of central to the to the discussion. Um, Uh, what are what are the thin parts in the same sense as before of MF? Okay, MF. Let me kind of draw a little cartoon of MF. MF, MF is a, man, a three manifold that fibers over the circle, and the fiber is a surface, so the surface kind of goes around in a circle, and it, it has a fixed thin decomposition just like. That the surface does, except it's a three-dimensional thick thin decomposition, and that turns out to be kind of important to know what it is. Um, and so, just to connect with the two boards, what we see here is a bunch of, so every component of the thin part of the three-manifold is a solid torus, so this, I'm going to kind of just draw it as a little cartoon. So this is a solid, uh, it's, a, it's a solid torus, so it's a circle across a disk. Okay, and the core, the circle across a point, is the core circle in there somewhere? It's some element of the group, uh, and in fact, it's it's homotopic to a curve on the surface, a simple curve on the surface. Turns out, and there's some pattern of these. They're all just joints, just like they are in two dimensions, but they live here in some kind of pattern. Each of them is quite large, so if there's a lot of them, then there's a big manifold. But there's some pattern of these things, and if you ask yourself what they are, what do you get? Well, you get. Um, a sequence of, not a sequence, a collection of curves, and actually maybe it's worth thinking what happens. So things get identified to the surface in two ways. I could, I could at least, I could push a, one of these solid tori down to the surface here, or I can move it once around and push it in again, or I can do it again. So there's actually a lot of, in, even if there's finitely many curves here, if I push them to the surface, I get an infinite number of curves. So the right place to look at this picture is in the infinite cyclic cover where I, I just lifted it like this, okay? And, and now I, I, I have all these, now I have kind of a, a list of that picture to a periodic picture where, and, and I can ask, what are all these, now all these curves are a family which I can think of each one of them as a curve on the surface, and I can ask, what is that family of curves? 
And moreover, this path, not path, sorry, this, this manifold, if I were to take a, an actual surface here, it would have some inherited geometric structure, let's say a complex structure from this living in this manifold. If I start pushing it forward, I get a path in tightening space. So it's like, a, it's like an analogous picture to this. I can imagine there's some kind of path in tightening space, and whenever the surface passes through the thin part, the, that curve gets very short on the surface. And so I'm passing through the thin part of the tightening space. So I've, I've, I'm naturally led to ask about these families of surfaces in the tightening space and where they go in the thin part. And the right, the, the kind of obvious guess is that this family of surfaces is a geodesic and it runs through the same thin parts that this you know, that, that somehow answers the question. If you look at the geodesic, it tells you what happens in the three manifold. And that turns out not to be exactly right, just like everything. Um, but but it, it is true that by studying the geometry of the curve complex, you can actually answer this question of what happens in the three manifold. Okay, so that's one kind of, uh, kind of happy end to this discussion is that that sort of Circle of ideas gives you a, a tool for describing what happens in this in this three manifold. And in fact, not just this three manifold, but kind of any three manifold who's, whose uh, topology is, is, a, is which is homotopy equivalent to a surface in this way. So, so that's that's kind of a, a motivation. And and once you answer this question, you're still kind of motivated to understand more precisely how this analogy works. Like so, this thing that I, I drew and pretend was geodesic. It's not quite a geodesic, but what do the geodesics do, and how, how do these pictures differ from each other? That's kind of an interesting question. And um, so, so kind of the circle of ideas to understand the relationship between Pythoner geodesics and uh, uh, hyperbolic manifolds and Bay-Peterson geodesics. So I haven't yet defined the Bay-Peterson metric, but, but there are kind of, there's kind of an imperfect set of connections between these three different geometric settings. And that's kind of what I want to describe. Okay, so that was the motivation for <coughs> thinking about this. So let's um, and I guess the, the yeah, so so the story is not actually completely understood, which is maybe why it's worth still thinking about it. I don't especially here. Um, there's there's more to say. Um, more to, to figure out. So, um, okay, so let's spend a few more minutes kind of explaining what, what shape the answer might have. Uh, and in order to do that, I have to introduce one more uh, combinatorial thing that fits it, that, that kind of one, one very quickly arrives at I'm thinking about this, and that is the notion of subsurface projections. Um, So it's a simple, simple notion, which is the following. You take, uh, you take a, an essential subsurface of our surface. You, uh, you take a curve. I, I want to kind of build a map from, uh, let's say, the curve complex of S to, I would like it to be to the curve complex of W, but it's not quite. It's, it's something completely different. It's, it's, it's um, bounded subsets of So it's, it's, all, it's not quite a map. It's a kind of almost defined map. What is the map? The map is just intersection. So you, you take, uh, let's see, what might W be here? Here's W. W on this side. And you take a curve in S, and you draw it in this picture. And it, if you put it in minimal position relative to W, it intersects it, well, in some pattern of, of arcs, right? So maybe. Maybe it'll run through um, a million times, but every time it runs through, it has to be disjoint from the other time, because it's a simple curve. So we must get some kind of family of arcs over here, which is up to isotopy, up to parallelism in W, only a finite collection, and they're all disjoint from each other. And so they kind of define, a, if you want, a system of curves in, in W just by uh, just by the surgery, I guess. You, you take, let me just draw one picture of that. You take, you take uh, an arc in W. If you take the arc union the boundary and thicken, you will get, um, here, 
here's the boundary of a regular neighborhood of an arc union. And the boundary, this is just a trick. It's not important exactly what it is. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it has two curves which are disjoint, and I could take those two curves as my uh, image. So I do this for each of the finitely many classes of arcs. I get a bunch of a finite collection of curves, and I put them here, and that's my image of, of the curve in W. And of course, you should remember, uh, mo most talks have an audience member who says, what about the empty set, right? So, that's, so it could be empty, right? So if, if you start something disjoint from W, then you get the empty set. And, and that's important, actually. It messes everything up, but, it's, but that's still at least a bounded subset. Um, Okay, so that's called a subsurface projection, and I will uh, uh, remark without further ado that annuli are slightly different. All the definitions are slightly different for annuli. It's an important case, uh, which I will ignore. Um, and what's the point of thinking about this? Um, it's, it's, this is like, so you should... <coughs> You should sort of think of this as, as like uh, the visual projection. If you look out in the world and you see things, everything you see is a projection to your, uh, to kind of a unit sphere around your eyeball. And this uh, is like that in the following sense. If you start, if inside, so the, the curve complex of W, when W is a subsurface, is, is, a, um, is a subset of uh, the link of the, of the simplex associated with the boundary point. If you, uh, in fact, if, if it happened to be, yeah, you can you can you can describe this link more more concretely. So the link of a of a multi curve is just a set of curve complexes of all its com complementary components. Right? In general, so here's W and here's the complementary surface, and and anything in the link of this curve is just a curve on one side or a curve on the other. So somehow the whole link is the join of several. But let's just pretend it's the whole thing for the purpose of this analogy. So it's like you have the following picture. You have like, uh, you have this, so if this is, if you think of this as boundary of W, this kind of a visual sphere around it, all of the edges emanating from the boundary of W, at least associated with the W side, form little segments like this. And what we're doing is we're taking an arbitrary point in the curve complex and sort of mapping it to this unit sphere. So it's like, it's like that. And in fact, it is a lot like that. So for example, if I took a, a so here's a, a theorem, if you took a, a geodesic, um, well, it's this geodesic for one, take the geodesic, let's say start in some definite distance away, and draw a geodesic ray going somewhere, uh, the whole image of this, so the image of a geodesic ray that's far, of a far geodesic ray, uh, is bounded, for example. So that would, that's what you expect from like a visual projection like this. All, in particular, all the radial lines. You'd imagine if it was really this, radial lines would map the points. Um, it's not quite exactly what it is, but at least it's true that kind of lines that are far away map the bounded set. So it's a little bit like a visual projection. Okay. So so the the it's like a visual projection in negative curvature. In negative curvature, that's true. What's positive curvature? Sorry. Yeah, right, right. So because we have a negatively curved space that we, we can, in some coarse sense, we have this coarse projection, which is uh, sort of like visual projection. So, so I want to, um, okay, so what's the point of this, of this projection? It's that if, if I'm trying to understand um, so I guess, suppose you want to know what a geodesic is doing. And you can ask this question either about a geodesic in the curve complex or about a geodesic in type of space. Um, oh yeah, let, let's say one more thing. So because we have this map from, we can actually define this map not, not just on curves, but also on uh, what else? We can map it, we can define it on measured foliations. Um, more or less with the same definition, take a measured foliation and intersect it with the surface in some, make it minimal in some sense, you'll still get a bunch of arcs. So more or less the same definition works. And you can also define it as a map from Teichmutter space into here because given any structure on the surface, you can take the systole, take the shortest curve in that structure, project it to W, or take the, you know, the, the hundred shortest curve and project them or something. So you can always kind of coarsely do something 
So map any of these objects into W. So, in, so you should think of it this way. So all the subsurfaces in S form a, a collection of observers. So here's, here's the W1, and over here is the W2, and so on. And they're all watching. And as you move along this geodesic, you can project, uh, say, let's call them GT, the points along this geodesic. You, you can look at, say, you know, pi W1 of GT as T goes from sort of left to right. And it's like, you know, so this is, these are the observers that are kind of watching this geodesic. And you can imagine that sort of what they see uh, tells you a lot about what this geodesic does. And, um, what you would like to say is that when, if you think about uh, negatively curved geometry, when if, if, a, if a path somehow, well, it's actually related to this, to this boundary statement here, if this visual diameter is large, then this path should come near that observer. That's, right? so, somehow, so far away paths uh, have to have small projection to, 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 to so paths, paths which are, uh, I guess we actually know from what we said. So this geod if, if you took a geodesic in the type number space, it's a quasi-geodesic in the curve complex. So if it's far enough away from this observer in the curve complex, then it's, it's uh, by this kind of notion here, its projection, its visual projection should be bounded. So somehow, somehow the, the, the kind of idea should be that the, the distance uh, along W between, uh, say, G... Let's write it this way. Um, so I'm not writing very informally because we're out of time almost, but imagine kind of a far away point on the left and a far away point on the right. Um, if, they're, if they're distance in W, so this means project into W and measure the distance. This is project distance in the curve complex between the projections. That's the short one. Okay. So if this is large, it should somehow imply that GT should come near boundary W. And if we were very optimistic, we would, we would even say that what it should mean is that the length of the boundary W um, over at the, you know, the measured in the structure associated to GD, GT, that in femum should be, should be very, very small. So maybe, right? So here's, just from this kind of analogy, to, um, you could imagine that this is what's going on, that these, these sort of coefficients associated with the subsurfaces should detect for you whether or not this path passes through the given thin part that you're interested in. Um, and this exact, so this is true, so interestingly so, enough, so, this, so the witnesses are sort of picking out certain thin parts that you're interested in? Right, yeah. right, right, right. You take, and, and um, so there's, it's, it's slightly more data actually, you have to be a little careful. So, the boundary of the surface is a multi-curve, which defines one of these kind of intersections of thin parts. And then I'm actually looking, so, so, but I've also chosen a, a component of the complement of the multi-curve. So there might have been several W's with the same boundary. And, this, and this, somehow I'm suggesting that you should expect that when a subsurface sees a big, uh, a big number, then its boundary must get short at some point during this path. Okay. Um, and there's some kind of, this is not quite true. I mean, there's, you might, in fact, you might ask whether it's kind of both ways. Um, okay, so let me tell you a couple of things, and then we'll try to move on to the So, um, first of all, it's exactly true where, in the, um, Where is it exactly true? It's exactly true for the three manifolds. So, so for example, if you so let me say it this way: if I have one of these, just to have a definite statement on the board, if I have one of these pseudonyms of F, and I have its two foliations, or right? these are the what are called the stable and unstable foliations. Those are the ones. 
with respect to which F has that nice structure that I described, where you have the north-south dynamics, um, then, then the following is in fact true that, that a curve, let me write it precisely. So for every k exists an epsilon such that if the length of a curve gamma, um, no, such that if, such that if the distance in a subsurface W between mu plus and mu minus is bigger than k, then the length of gamma in the manifold mf is less than epsilon. Let, oh, sorry, no gamma, boundary of w. Okay, and conversely, for all epsilon there exists a k, such that if the length of gamma in mf um, is less than epsilon, then there exists a w, so that gamma is a boundary curve, and the distance between mu plus and mu minus is bigger than k. So big projections imply short curves, and short curves imply big projections in this particular way. And I guess it's important for the way I've stated it that this uh, this doesn't depend on f. So this is maybe you should write it like this: there, for all k, there's an epsilon system for all f. So I want some uniformity in the statement, otherwise I'm not going to be saying anything. Um, <coughs> Okay, so that's that's supposed that's that's an actual an exact theorem. Uh, I guess this is due to uh, so this is paper with uh, Jeff Brock and, and Dick Canary, and um, and this is kind of the model for what we expect to be what we'd like to be true in general. It's not exactly true if you replace the three manifold with a with a Teichmuller geodesic, which is kind of the, the thing I want to talk about. So. Um, so let's see. So what's true for? So now suppose I have a type energy desic. So GT is a type energy desic, and then let's. Um, Let's call mu plus and mu minus the endpoints in the same. Well, again, just like before, the Teichmann geodesic has these two foliations, so you can still talk about about these two endpoints. Um, and now, so here's a, a theorem of, of uh, Rafi. Um, let me let me sort of point out. So what? So the less is true here. So let's so. One version of this theorem says that if all of these numbers are bounded above, then all of these numbers are bounded below, and vice versa. Right? That's kind of the bounded case. So that's true for Teichmann geodesic. So if, uh, so let's say it this way: the supremum of all the distances uh, finite implies is equivalent to saying that the infimum of all. The, what do I want to say here? Let's let's let L gamma of G be the shortest length in the femur over all t of the L gamma of GT. Okay, you have this geodesic, and for a given curve, you ask, does it go through the thin part of the gamma? So let's, what is the shortest the gamma ever gets along this geodesic? And now we can say that that number, L gamma of G, the femur over all gamma, is positive. So, kind of independently, in fact, you can make this more quantitative. But let's just say that. So if there's an upper bound on the projections, then there's a lower bound on the lengths, and vice versa. So that's kind of one kind of case of that theorem. And, um, and I guess, uh, which direction? If, yeah, and for all epsilon there exists a k, so that if dw of u plus minus is bigger than k, then uh, the length boundary W G is less than epsilon. And that's also true, but the final thing is not true. So there exists, but uh, the, con the, the last converse is not true. In other words, there are examples of geodesics where something gets short, but it's not for this reason. So a curve, other things do get short for this reason. You can always kind of, uh, it's, it, well, 
you can, you can try to analyze what gets short for what reason. I think it's actually currently uh, not entirely clear to me what the right answer is. So it might still be a good question. Uh, so Rafi did kind of analyze the way that this fails, uh, but I think there's not a complete description of you know, how exactly does it fail. In other words, what is the right... Um, criterion for when things, when, when, the, when, for which thin parts the geodesic passes through. There's a little bit of, of, of play in here, which I think is still open. Um, right. I should say, so, so his, Kassar's, he was my student, and, and his thesis problem was to prove this is true. So, <laughs> so that was a failure. Yeah. So. Um, Okay, so all right, so so let me okay. So that's the the situation is that there's kind of I guess I'm hinting that there's a lot of structure here and, and uh, which is not entirely clear. And that okay, and that I'll, let me stop trying to sell it. Let me let me try to kind of try to connect this to the Bay Peterson situation where where uh, where things are, are more difficult. So, um, so what is the? I mean, so the Bay Peterson method. First of all, what is it? Um, so it's a bad sign that I'm not going to give you the definition. <laughs> I'm not. But what, but it's a natural definition, except it's hard to work with. So let me just say, what is it? So it it's, it it is a Riemannian metric. Um, defined by the natural L2 pairing on the tangent space, or the co actually the cotangent space, that already is a bad signal, right? <laughs> um, so just to kind of, okay, just to wave my hand for a second, the, the tangent or the cotangent space of the techno space, I didn't talk about it, but it somehow Somehow you should deform complex structures by some infinitesimal thing. You should take a surface and you can do something to deform the structures. That's usually measured by some kind of a tensor on the surface. It's some, some kind of differential object that tells you how you're moving the, the structure. So, that's, so, so in fact, the cotangent space is a space of tensors. Uh, and what is it? It actually turns out to be the same. It's the same holomorphic quadratic differential space that we talked about already, uh, which I refused to define before. And so, but, but once you have that, you, you can, you know, you immediately want to do things, you know, you want to write things like this right away, right? Um, except you have to decide exactly what you integrate against, and it turns out you have to scale it in some way by the um, hyperbolic metric, and then, uh, see, I'm going to get it wrong. Maybe it's like this. But you, you scale it by the hyperbolic metric like this, and then you integrate it with respect to the area form of the hyperbolic metric. There's some thing you should do. Looks sort of like this. this is going to be on video, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you, you already signed the form. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, well, all right, so hopefully I won't lose my uh, next answer. Okay, so. So this, the, the, so this gives you some kind of, this gives you a, a Riemannian metric because it's a, it's, a, it's a Hermitian form on the cotangent space, and then there's a corresponding Hermitian form in the tangent space. And the last thing to say about it is that you, the di one difference between this and the Teichmuller metric is that it really explicitly is sensitive to the hyperbolic geometry that actually appears in the definition, whereas the Teichmuller metric is kind of, is really thinking, it's somehow numerically paying attention to the complex geometry more than the hyperbolic geometry. So, so it is true that somehow this is more sensitive to hyperbolic features of the surface. Okay, so this defines some kind of a of a Riemannian metric. By the way, the Teichmuller metric is not a Riemannian metric. It's a Finsler metric. It has a norm, but not a not a inner product um, in the tangent space. Okay, so so there's some definition, and it, and there are theorems about it. So um, so a bunch of them are, are due to Scott Wolpert, um, and let me sort of list them. So what's relevant to us is the curvature. So yeah, this Riemannian metric is uh, now case tensor curvature is negative at every point, uh, but it's not bounded away from. It's not pinched. It's not bounded away.
from either zero or minus infinity. So, so that's bad, right? It's kind of singular. Um, all right, it is, it is incomplete. Um, maybe that's enough to say right now. Well, yeah, it's incomplete. <coughs> um, so I'll say a minute about it. How, how can it be incomplete? So what is it, how do you go to, how do you go to infinity and finite time in this metric? I'll say, this is, I'll say something about that. This is actually, I think, also Wolfert and Chu. Um, I think I got that right. And then, uh, maybe, okay, so this looks very bad. If it's incomplete, how can you do anything? But it's at least geodesically convex, which is to say, there are geodesics beginning and different points. So you might worry that, you know, you have a point and you have another point. You might worry that if you try to find the shortest path, it'll just kind of fail to converge because the metric is incomplete. But no, actually, there is a geodesic between the points. That's good news. Um, okay. Um, all right, so that's, so it's somehow kind of better in some ways and worse in some ways than the metric, depending on what it is you want to do with it. Um, What's the incompleteness coming from? Well, it's coming, coming from the same thin part discussion that we had in the lecture. <coughs> uh, and and it's, it's basically this. You can, uh, for any, if, if gamma is any curve, um, you can, uh, there, there exists a path, say, you know, f t in, in the Teichner space, so that the length of f is finite, and uh, the length, this is length in the, in the Bay-Peterson metric, and, and, and the, the geodesic length of the curve gamma along Ft goes to zero. So you can pinch off a curve in finite time. So, and in fact, you can describe a completion. So the completion uh, append, you know, adds strata, uh, which look like the Teichner space of the complement of the curve. The thin part of the No, no, no. So, no, because the thin part is a Teichner space of a simpler surface, and it might have infinite diameter. So this space itself has infinite diameter. So it kind of, it kind of looks like this. There's some, so again, there's a space, which is this. And then somewhere, you've pinched off a curve gamma. And when you've pinched it off, you can, there's a completion stratum, which looks like the Teichner space of the complementary surface. It's co-dimension two in the space, actually, um, because when you pinch, what you forget is the length of gamma, which has gone to zero, and the amount of twisting around gamma, which is one more parameter. So there's kind of a, a co-dimension two object here. Um, it's a little more complicated, but roughly speaking. And then, uh, and this thing itself is a spectrum space, so it has infinite diameter, but it also connects to other ones. So it's possible here's here's the stratum. It's called the stratum of gamma, where you, gamma has length zero, and here's the stratum of Beta, beta has length zero, and they might intersect in, a, in, a, in the stratum associated with the gamma union beta, which is another type of space, if gamma and beta are disjoint. So it's again the same combinatorics as the curve complex, so once again in the same business. Um, so there's some kind of infinite picture, and a locally infinite picture too, because um, in the Teichner space, I could kind of, there's actually, an in, it's not a locally compact space anymore at these completion points, because the Dane twists around gamma act fixing the points in the stratum, but moving everything around them kind of with infinite orbits. So there's a lot of, actually a lot of complication. All right, so that's, uh, but it still has this lovely geodesic convexity, which means you can still kind of think about geodesic. So I guess the, um, so when, well, I guess we thought about this enough earlier. Uh, I'll come back to this again. Let me erase it now. So, okay. So, so the question, okay, so, so in order to kind of try to understand this setting with the same kind of language, we, we first have to have to deal with the fact uh, that we don't have, we already don't even have the tools to ask the question. Because how did we ask the question for a type of geodesic? We said, we looked at this, we said, uh, what is the, the kind of visual distance between the two foliations associated with the type of geodesic? And um, 
Right? So how do we even look at, how do we even ask this question if we don't have foliation associated with the Bay Peterson? If you look at the definition, it does not come with a foliation. It's some, there's some mysterious L2 pairing, and then it defines a Riemannian metric, and you solve an ODE to figure out what the geodesics are. There's no foliation sitting there. In fact, it's a, it's a big difference between the two settings. So, so how do you find a foliation? So it turns out, well, you can do it. So um, is, there a, is there a way to parameterize the geodesics? Are there big Peterson maps? I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, is, is there kind of a canonical way to, to, to deform along a Bay Peterson geodesic that makes the foliation kind of evident? Kind of, I, I don't know. Yeah, that would be great. That's what's missing. Um, but here's a here's a, a way, a kind of quick way to, to get around this. You can study. So first of all, okay, if you have Remember in the very beginning, I said the measured foliation space can be identified with the measured lamination space. Here, here we have these foliations. Here we have laminations, which are geodesic patterns, you know, geodesic uh, closed sets that are kind of laminated by geodesics with transverse measures. And while here we have this kind of Euclidean geometry, this has a hyperbolic geometry, and you can define if, if you have a measured if you have an object here, if you think of it as a measured lamination, it has a well-defined length. So the length of a measured lamination with respect to a hyperbolic structure, this makes sense. Um, and it's a further theorem of Wolpert, kind of relevant to all those theorems, that these length functions, so length lambda is a map from Eichmuller space to log plus, right, this is now, again, measured lamination, you take its, its geodesic length in the metric, this function is geodesic, it is convex, as a function, so that means it's a convex function along geodesics. Um, and that means that you can kind of study this function and it tells you what to look at, and, and if you kind of follow the analogies around, you realize this is what you're looking at. If you look at Here's what the picture you see. You graph. Here's here's the x-axis, and um, and you have some geod. So now suppose that GT is a Bay Peterson geodesic, and I should say if it's a Bay Peterson geodesic, it could have either. I mean, if you continue it and continue it, it might have finite length and land in the in the compactification locus, or it might go on forever and have infinite length. Okay, and somehow when it lands in this in this Locus, you kind of know what you should say. You should say that it's that the foliation is, or the lamination is just the curves that have been pinched. That's what you should say. Because the lamination is always uh, whatever got short relative to everything else. So let, let's ignore that case since we only have a few minutes uh, and ask about an infinite geodesic. What do we associate with an infinite geodesic? And so you look at this infinite geodesic and you, and you graph functions of the, of the, you graph the lengths of, of curves or laminations on this, on this graph. And what do you see? Well, you have this convexity theorem of Wolford. Every one of these length functions, either for closed curves or for kind of laminations, is convex. So it start, you know, it has to look something like this. Right? Just like in calculus. Of course, we don't know how long it'll, it'll spend near its minimum. We, you know, there's no, this doesn't quite come with, um, uh, with lower bounds on the second derivative. We don't quite know if it's uniformly convex or not. It's complicated a little bit what happens. But it's a complex function. Uh, so once it starts increasing, it goes off to infinity. So now you can go along this graph further and further out and, and say, at every moment in time, there is some curve with, uh, whose, um, whose length is bounded above. Take the shortest curve. In the surface. There's an upper bound and a length of the shortest curve. So you go here and you can always find a curve that's not too long at this point and then kind of go backwards in time. It can't, it, it eventually has to, you know, it, it's an infinite list of curves. This is an infinite geodesic. You get an infinite list of curves like this. They can't all be bounded here. They must get longer and longer. So if you, if you, if you pull it backwards, you'll get a picture like that. And then if you rescale it so that it has length one, at the beginning, we scale this one over here, you'll get something like that. 
Could you label it? I missed it. So yeah, so this is, is L. this is L of gamma n, where n is, you know, I just do this over and over again. This is maybe a time n if you want. Okay, at time n, I think the shortest curve, okay. called gamma n. It's pretty short here, it's like no more than 10. Now I'll go backwards. Um, yeah, there's some cases to worry about, but let's, let's take the case where we know that these are all different. So, wait, so we have a we have a Dave Peterson G that's you have a Bay Pearson GDS. That's the first where they get all the line functions. Right. So we draw all the line functions for the GDS. They all kind of live in this graph. You pick one that has a minimum far away for this curve. And then you, you extrapolate all the way back to the beginning where it's quite long. Uh, and now you rescale it. Remember, we can rescale things in the measured lamination space. Rescale it to have length one. So this is, this is kind of the, the rescale gamma. OK? And then repeat. You get a sequence of functions like this. All of them kind of have roughly the same structure. They're all going down, so they're all bounded above. And their minima are getting further and further away. And take a limit. And the limit, a limit, would be some, some lamination. Well, it's not clear what it's doing exactly, right? Some lamination that's monotonically decreasing. Now, I don't know if it's going to zero or not. There are various things I don't know about it, but it's at least monotonically decreasing. So, and then you prove a theorem, which is that um, all these limits, this, let me say quickly here, the supports of all such limits take, uh, the, the union of the supports of all such limits is a lamination. Which is to say, Um, so this is a theorem of uh, Brock and Mason. So a priori, maybe you do this, and there are all the choices of what gamma ends I take, and if you, you get lots of different limits, and they're all just incoherent, different from each other and stuff. But I'm saying that you put them all together, they never intersect each other. They all fit together into one master lamination, and, and they might have different measures. Remember, these things come with with the picture, the lamination, and the transverse measure. So this gives you perhaps many different transverse measures, but only one union, the union together is one big lamination. That's the statement. So that we call that lamination the ending lamination of the race. So if you go in positive time, you get a lamination, let's call it mu plus. So it's a la now it's a lamination without a measure. I forgot the measure because I didn't know what was going on with the measures. If you go in the opposite direction, you have the same discussion, except now they're going this way, and you call that mu minus. Okay? So now I have some data to ask about. And maybe since we're running out of time, let me, let me right away confess to the most embarrassing thing I don't know about this. Oh, let me leave Casper's theorem up there. with mu plus equal to mu minus. Um, in, the, in the Teichmuller setting, the geodesic was associated to a pair of transverse foliations, the transverse lamination. They were certainly not the same lamination. Um, and, and so you would expect, if you were optimistic, that the answer would be no. Okay, but I don't know that the answer is no. I think that's maybe... It's not just that I, that I don't know the answer. Every time we try to do anything with this question, we always end up eventually kind of asking this question. It kind of pops up as a natural question whenever you try to do anything. So it's, I think it's, it's a kind of signal that either things are much weirder than I think or that this is kind of a question to answer. Um, so what, what can we say? Um, and 
So let me. So how close can we come to this theorem of Rafi? So, and this is now combined work, I guess, with uh, Rock and Maser, and some of the last pieces of what I mean. Um, and so, first of all, the first thing is true. So, soup EW plus and minus uh, finite is true if and only if um, the female of the lengths. Now, this is a, a Bay Peterson geodesic. So if there's an upper bound on projection, then there's a lower bound on, on the kind of lengths of, of curves, and vice versa. So at least the kind of the class of what are called bounded, we like to, one way to say this is it's that bounded combinatorics implies bounded geometry, and vice versa. That's kind of the, so at least that case is understandable. Uh, and then uh, maybe nothing else, is, let's see. So uh, do we know? Yes, um, let, let me say that, um, let me not say that this is the running iron. So there, there, there's some kind of fairly special assumptions about the combinatorics, about kind of the combinatorics of these numbers imply that the, the, the kind of, the, let me just, so the, quanti the quantified versions work. So in other words, if you try to prove a theorem like this, or the converse, it goes the other way. If you, if you have some, there are certain assumptions about the topology of the surfaces in which these things are large. Uh, and this is kind of, and this, is, this is called kind of a narrowness condition. I'm not going to say anything about this. Um, and this is uh, what the Bachman did. Um, so with extra kind of combinatorial conditions on the, on the whole picture, you can actually have a correspondence between the short curves and the big projections. And so you can understand sort of the itinerary of these things. Um, and let me also say, here's another theorem. So uh, uh, Burns, uh, Maser, Wilkinson proved uh, that the geodesic flow on the Teichmuller space, the Bay Peterson metric, Teichmann space module of the mapping class group, that's the moduli space with the Bay Peterson metric, the geodesic flow there is ergodic. Um, so any kind of a typical geodesic goes everywhere. So a typical geodesic will not satisfy this condition, and it will not satisfy whatever this condition. So somehow, with probability one, this does, neither of these things, situations happen. So, so, um, so the generic behavior is not controlled by any of these theorems. So that's one thing. Um, uh, but maybe a last thing to say, because we're really out of time, right? We have, yeah. So the last thing to say uh, is that um, the, <clears throat> sort of the, this is kind of more recent, actually, which is strange, we thought of it long ago, was that this converse is still false, so it's still possible. So there exist examples where the distance in some W between u plus and u minus um, is, is bounded. So I guess you should think of it as a sequence of examples. is small, let's say, but the length uh, of the boundary of w along the geodesic is also small. So, kind of, so let's say it this way. Kind of, you want um, we want a sequence of examples, so maybe we should write it like this. You have a sequence of examples, and this goes to zero for a certain curve, even though these quantities stay bounded. This, that's kind of analogous to, uh, to Rafi's uh, examples. Now, not it's sort of a different story, actually. It's, it's constructing these examples is actually quite hard in the big figures. Because con constructing anything synthetically is hard in this metric, which is not that well defined. But not that kind of you find. Um, but this sort of shows that the most optimistic version of this discussion was that although the Teichmuller geodesics aren't quite doing the right thing to describe the hyperbolic three manifolds, and remember the three manifolds we got a perfect 
correspondence. So this theorem says Tycho and are not quite the right description of the hyperbolic three manifolds, but it was still sort of, there's kind of reason to suspect that Bay Peterson geodesics do give the right description that matches the three manifolds. There are various other bits of evidence for that. Uh, but this kind of shows that that's not the case. So, uh, so really all three regimes are, are different from each other. Um, and, and, and maybe that's it. I guess I, I'll leave it open. So, so we really don't have uh, a complete picture of what's going on here. So I think that would be interesting. So maybe that's the last one. Other questions? Very naive one. What? Uh, the very naive one. Uh, yeah. If you go on the modular space, the vice figure symmetric, the closed geodesic are also in vibration is the uh, each curve, each class of curve gives you a closed geodesic for the vice figure symmetric. No, no, the closed geodesics in the vice figure symmetric are in are in bijection with the pseudo and also they are homeomorphisms. Yeah. And what is the length? Because in the dimensional case it's just the bijection, and in the vice figure it has meaning this length of the curve? Uh it it doesn't have the same meaning. Yeah, um, sure. But for what would be... Oh, so it's closely related to the volume of the of three manifolds. Manifold? Yeah, that's one of the reasons why we think these things are, are better related. Right. In which yeah. sense, it is the volume, which is... It is, it is an approximation to the volume. Oh, an so, approximation. Okay. Yeah, so there's this theorem of Brock. Uh -huh. So it's kind of related. Uh, if you fix the genus of the surface, then there's, there's, kind of, there's a bound in each direction. So if you look at overall geodesics in the modular space, the length, the ratio between... The length of the geodesic and the volume of the three manifold is bound to the volume below. Hmm. So overall, it's sort of awesome. So that's and, and there's kind of there's various questions about how this behaves uh, as the genus grows, which are a little more subtle. But um, yeah, but there's kind of a relationship. Other questions? Yeah. Well, thank you. You're much more for all of us.